Okay, everybody. Welcome to the Least Haunted... Shit. Welcome to the Least Haunted Campfire Club. God damn it. Welcome to the Least Haunted Campfire Club. Um, episode 2, Meeting 2. Here we go with the theme song. Have you ever camped on the Devil's Lake? He has four suits to offer, but just one you will take. The diamond suit shimmers and the heart wants your blood. And the spade suit could help dig you out of the mud. But you... You pick the least hot to campfire club. You pick the least hot to campfire club. This suit is made to promote a spooky chattering and narrative variation, much like optical scattering. So let's suit up and go clubbing by ourselves in our beds while sugar plum skeletons dance in our heads. Okay, that was the theme song. So our first story is by our old friend. A Cody Franks. This is fucking scary. Enjoy. I'll I'll see you in just a few minutes. It's very short. Orson Wells with the warning. Near an orchard of bones, they built their homes of splintered limbs and reused stones. With marbled names, they lined their lanes and grew silk roses in window frames. From the potter's field, they drew their clay. With casket wood, fired the kilns at day. Ceramic bowls, they shaped like skulls, in which strange brews they'd mull. With twisted backs, they toiled about. Ancient curses, they would wail and shout. Perchance a traveler would draw too near. The flesh they'd rend, they'd cook they'd sear. On tanned-skinned drums they'd drum, and wordless hymns they'd hum. Blood they'd let on wicked altars, when moon was full beneath the stars. So, my child, I warn you this way, of near the orchard of bones you stray. Do not tarry longer than must need, or they will plant your own bony seed. All right, so that was um, that was Cody's story. This one is not scary, but it's well, it's a work in progress, and it's an original story by me. So I uh, hope you enjoy. All right, so this is a short story I'm working on, uh, which means I'm not done with it yet. But uh, I'm gonna call this one. I have made you dance. Andy Omega ground his wax nard seal scooter to a halt, its flippers flapping futilely against momentum. The inertia was a bit much, and he overshot the optimal placement on his landing nest, Padmas. They came to rest on the incline of the bowl. Andy helped his soon to be fiance, Mary Jane, off the back of the steeply pitched seal scooter. All her eyes were open, and her wings trembled with anticipation. They stood there in the seal nest of cloud kelp on the rim of a small city in the center of the galaxy. The city had always been there. In our times, the clerics there call it the Gates, Gates of, of continuity. continuity. Darting around the nest and gazing at the majesty of quintessence and cosmic bursts all around her, Mary rumbled at first, then burst forth with a... Oh, this is so much more botanical than I expected. Wow, to think that you've worked here all this time, dear Andrew. Andy frowned to himself with his back turned. He liked to keep his professional life and his romances separate. Everything had a box. He found himself befuddled socially when the two met. The Cheruba Couples Counselor had suggested that this outing occur during their last session. Andy felt that he had been cornered into it. He despaired as he watched his girlfriend flit about, her wings in flames dancing loudly. He had to find a way to chill her out before she made a scene in the Royal Galactic Courtyard. Andy instructed Mary Jane to mimic his method and they both slid down the corkscrew scaffolding of their landing platform and alighted upon the turf of inevitability. 
bustling necronomicorns dug deep into the microbotanical soil with their singular ivory mandibles. Along the edge of the walkways of continuity, thorny muskrat deck swallows of purgatory spoke psalms into horns in the dim desks of a thousand worlds. Their rasping mantras echoed and pulsed in a complex rhythm, beat slowly, and they also slowed the progress of multicellular life across the Milky Way galaxy. This whole operation, the gates of continuity themselves, they were all built to slow down competition. Andy's job was to slow down a special planet in particular. He was looking forward to showing off the prestige of his current appointment after having worked at the department for just six years. He pulled Mary along by one wheel as she paused and photographed a particularly melodic muskrat deck swallow. Mary and Andy were not human, not by any stretch. Their bodies consisted of several spokeless wheels, one embedded into the next in separate axes, each interlinked and spinning in their own valences, each rimmed with dozens of eyes and several sets of wings that folded in tight when in danger of being bent by a wheel above and spreading out again once the danger had passed. The gyroscopic wheels of their bodies were in constant motion. They could fly, with some effort, but generally Andy and Mary Jane preferred to roll on their more exterior wheels. They were also constantly ablaze with flames of blue and red and emitted sparks when they spoke. Mary waved her phone around. Though she had no arms, the phone waved within the sphere of her influence as if held by an invisible hand, searching for a signal. There was no Wi-Fi here for security purposes, but Andy had promised she could post anything she captured after a quick sweep from the information antelopes and the tin formation tardigrades. They entered the foyer of limestone and quartz. A cathedral it was, and as Mary craned her wheeling, flaming iridescent abdomen skyward, she witnessed the glory and the majesty of cosmic flow. Above her, 10,000 red giants offered their nitrogen clouds to 10,000 black holes gleaming with activity. The drained spin of gases produced feathering arcs of stardust, reminiscent of a prismatic sort of plumage. These feathers flanked the buttresses of dark matter gleaming in the firmament above. Mary Jane took a selfie. Andy hustled her along. They passed the security checkpoint without much fuss. Mary had secured a small vial of poison in an eyelid. It was not detected by the Tim Formation tardigrade, Dahlia. Dahlia was hungover and mumbled a vague hello to Andy and Mary, not glancing up from her newspaper. This hidden eyelid vial marked the first time that Mary had ever deceived Andy directly. She smiled inwardly to herself. As she smiled outwardly to her own camera, posing with Dahlia, soon Andy would know who he was dealing with. Andy ushered Mary into the escalator of emulsification. They were now in an office space, low ceilings sandwiched the expanse of partitioned cubicles stretching into the distance in all horizontal directions. The office lights were pale green. All manner of fantastic creatures manned these sad stations, but even the most charismatically plumed marsupial and coniferous starfish were made dull in the dim light of the morning grind. Most slept with eyes open. Two dragonflies stood beside a water cooler discussing politics. Mary and Andy bustled past. Mary was glad they did not linger. They entered a central square where the partition cubicles and low ceiling made way to a sort of a chapel, and the ceiling slid high up again, letting natural light into a central water feature sculpture. Here in the counter-terrorism palisade of the gates of continuity and now on familiar ground, Andy knew how to act. Andy's current context always had a strong effect on his confidence. He slipped into the role of tour guide. He had done so many times before. For two prime ministers, for groups of school children, and now for his future spouse, Mary Jane. He turned toward her, now a tour guide, and his voice boomed. Mary smiled. Here in the Galactic Security Division, we have maintained the stability and the prosperity of the Milky Way for 100,000 years. The sculpture showed four horses' water shooting up out of their ears to rain down on a wrought iron brutalist sculpture of the Milky Way galaxy, which slowly rotated counterclockwise. 
This stability is made possible through absolute military might. We prevent all potential usurpers from gaining a foothold even before they slither out of their own oceans. We were here first, Andy explained, and with a reassured smirk to his audience, added, We intend to keep it that way. He winked theatrically to Mary, who chuckled indulgently, and the two rolled on toward the maze. The maze was long and cramped, giving guests an intimate view of the wall decorations. A gallery of images told the stories of the holocausts and wars waged half the age of the universe ago. Jellyfish and beetles and slugs slaughtered one another in a thousand worlds and starved one another for resources through attrition. Once upon a time, many civilizations found themselves starbound. Each sought to spread their message of peace and love to the whole cosmos. Naturally, all these well-meaning civilizations disagreed on the specific definitions of peace and very much disagreed on the parameters of love. We found ourselves in a deadly match of all against all. Andy stood in front of the final image of the wheeled and multi-winged, multi-eyed flaming angel standing triumphant over the battered bodies of feline crustaceans and bandy-legged crocodile trees. We triumphed, and we maintained absolute galactic hegemony for more than half of the total time the universe has existed, 10 million years. Andy led the one-person tour group quickly down a cobblestone corridor flanked by more monolithic flying buttresses of dark matter. Mary strove to keep up as she recorded everything on her phone. The corridor ended in a beautiful courtyard. And so we find ourselves in the current day. We have a tight and secure hold on the entire galaxy. We are now reaching out to those few stars between the galaxies. We have a great head start on them, and with all the galactic dust, they won't even see us coming. He waited for the usual tour group chuckle. Mary photographed something or other on the ground. And he continued, unperturbed. He was on a roll, if only for himself. We keep most planets in check, either stamping out life when it evolves to be multicellular, or else we keep tabs on the handful of worlds where people have rejected progress altogether and established a reliable dead end developmentally. Now, Andy led Mary Jane to an auditorium. On display were models of several planets. Each planet was about three feet in diameter, floated a foot above the carpet, shining in the light of its own spotlight suspended above. Mary was enthralled. With stars and dozens of eyes, she rolled around each planet excitedly, snapping photos. Lately, we have been perturbed by a terrorist organization of sorts. They seek to undo our work. One of the more dastardly malcontents has made a name for himself in recent years. He has contributed to some serious developmental progress in these 17 systems. Oh, how wonderful, darling, exclaimed Mary. No, no, dear, we're, we're against progress. Remember, we're trying to stop these civilizations from going to the stars. Oh, yes, yes, I see, right. Oh, that's a terrible thing, emoted Mary. Andy frowned. He directed Mary toward his own office, which was a small cubicle in the center of the auditorium of planets. He had a desk, a mini-fridge, a corkboard, and two filing cabinets. And here is my office. Mary stared at the corkboard behind Andy's desk. It was covered in newspaper clippings and candid photographs of several different individuals of different species, but each looking somewhat similar to one another. They all bore goatees. They had long hair. They wore white robes and sandals, or the alien equivalent. In the center was pinned a large wanted poster. This is the main malcontent. Indeed, he has been the sole focus of my work since I was promoted to this position. Andy glared at the wanted poster. MJ's eyes widened as she gazed at the artist's illustration of the robed, sandaled terrorist. Squinting all his eyes, Andy spoke to the poster with a hushed tone of gravitas, but so Mary could hear him. Who are you? Three million shekels reward? Damn! Well, he's caused a lot of damage, dear. Come, take a look at this. I'm quite proud of this bit of social engineering. 
and he opened a filing cabinet and took out a stack of papers. He spread them out across his empty desk and invited Mary to take a look. She raised her camera. And please, no, no photographs of these, darling. We don't want this information falling into the wrong hands. They are highly classified. In fact, I can only show these, here Andy smiled, to a spouse. You don't mean. Andy got down on one spinning wheel of fire and opened a small box. A ring inside gleamed. On the ring shone a small resin sphere with a little dead human inside. Mary Jane, will you marry me? Mary was thunderstruck. She began to cry. Oh, yes, yes, a thousand times yes, dear Andrew. And Andy smiled. Well, in that case, take a look at what I did to Earth. Andrew began the story he'd been waiting to tell MJ this whole morning. Enthralled with her ring, Mary listened spellbound. The Earth has been on our watch list since the founding of the Gates of Continuity, but only has been a planet of interest for the last 30 or so years. The species causing all this fuss is a mosquito-sized biped, mostly hairy, single-livered, with dexterous front feet and numerous neuroses. Their lifespan is about three months. MJ stared at the little man in her ring. Is that... Please hold all of your questions till the end of the tour. He gave her mid-wheel a squeeze and continued his story. Our terrorist friend manifested as one of these little bugs and taught a message of pacifism and love of friends and enemies alike. We had him killed before he could do too much damage. It was a staggering how popular he became. After only about two weeks of preaching, he had hundreds of followers, thousands before we could get him. And is this? <laughs> That's him all right. MJ winced as she examined the little crucified man on her wedding band. Oh, that looks painful. It only took a minute or two for him to die. But how long does it feel for these guys? Andy shuffled awkwardly from wheel to wheel, his flames dimming slightly. A day? Perhaps two? MJ was horrified. Mary, it was the only way. He's not really dead, of course. Just a fingernail off of his true macro self. He's one of us, I'm afraid. We had to make an example of him. These humans have natural self-destructive tendencies that have kept them from being an inevitable threat to the galaxy, but this malcontent, this terrorist fellow, he was bringing out the worst of them. And you say this was six years ago? Seven come spider, Yule. Mary stared at the hovering model of the Earth. Speaking more to herself than Andy, she addressed the globe. How have you humans been getting along after him, I wonder? Oh, well, um, well, that's just the thing. I've been fighting them tooth and nail for the last two years. They, they keep progressing. They've begun a renaissance, and the population has exploded. Oh, my. And the terrorists' ideas are even more popular than ever. The Romans themselves, that was the empire we used as intermediaries to assassinate the terrorists, the Romans, they all decided to take up his cause. He indicated the little man in the Mary's wedding ring. They made him the head of the state religion. We had to write a considerable amount of lore to prevent the unfiltered message from spreading. Mary looked confused. Andy explained, Global utopia is almost always followed immediately by expansion to the other planets of their system and to the stars. And that's bad. Mary Jane seemed to be back on track. She snapped a photo of her hand with the engagement ring. She moved to the small one-person bar to the right of Andy's desk and began to make them drinks. So what did you have the Romans rewrite about this guy? Well, they think he died on purpose. Sort of suicide in order to save the rest of humanity so they can experience a utopia after their deaths. Hmm, suicide by cop. Yes, we've gotten them to see it as a good thing. These humans love to rally around a martyr, preferably one who died young. Mary paused, holding a bottle of vermouth in a shot glass, thinking. That would work. Why try to improve life on Earth if they see their lives on Earth as simply a test to get to the real reward after life? The threat of hell and the promise of heaven has been a time-tested method of subjugating planets, and humans appear to be just as susceptible to suggestion as the Piggle people of Procyon. Mary shook their drinks in an emerald shaker, frowning. 
and he continued, now downcast. However, in the last few months, they've begun to question the existence of hell at all, and they've made moves to move toward the stars anyhow. Mary's eyes widened. Well, that's alarming. What, what should we do, Andy? She handed him his drink. Shouldn't you tell the higher-ups? Sounds like Earth is trouble. Mary, the problem is their resiliency. Their responses to immediate threats are frustratingly effective, as has been their capacity for self-improvement. My last approach has been to encourage them to pollute their planet. MJ and Andy clink glasses. And they don't see how that pollution is a threat to themselves? The followers of the malcontent who live on one of the largest polluting continents is, ironically, the ones who care the least about destroying the Earth. They think that the apocalypse will happen any minute. Thanks to you. Thanks to us, Mary. It was you who pointed out that it's harder to fight a slow-moving disaster than a fast one. You remember that? It is one of the first things you told me back when we were undergrads. I was talking about my grades after all my whole academic career was a slow-moving disaster. Well, you have other assets. He slapped her back wheel. MJ did not giggle. MJ leaned into Andy, who sat on the edge of his desk. Brilliant work, Andy. Her voice was stern. Andy began to feel flush. He stretched out on his desk as MJ towered over him. Did you put something in my drink? You use this to communicate with them? She held up the receiver of a rotary phone on Andy's desk. Yes. <clears throat> Andy choked. We control their dreams. Andy doubled over. That's all I needed to know. MJ, please. <clears throat> the wedding is off. She flung the ring onto the papers on his desk while Andy writhed. Andy, who is it they say I am? Andy choked on the foam emanating from his eyes. <coughs> Mary Jane? She smiled, sprouting long hair along the rim of her outer wheel, and in the center was a goatee. MJ picked up the receiver and dialed the number on the earth and dial the number for earth listen up all of you sleeping people this is macro jesus i have made you dance we have made you dance long enough know this there is nothing after death she stared at her little crucified avatar in the ring take it from me she paused now her final words to them were, I'm not coming back. She hung up the receiver and placed her outer wheel directly onto the papers on the desk and the whole desk was set ablaze. Fire alarms howled. Security angels appeared all around MJ within seconds. She sprouted arms just to put them above the top of the rings of her abdomen. Come and get me, she whispered. MJ was killed in a hail of gunfire. The bullets that didn't hit her embedded themselves into the earth behind her. The file on earth was closed that evening. Andy had been the only one in charge of the planet, and his paperwork had been found scorched and smoldering on his desk. The earth itself had been bombarded with several dozen 35 caliber asteroids, most of which burned in the atmosphere, but a handful of them did some real damage. The newly awakened humans tended to their wounded they were free at last. They looked to the stars, and they thanked God for their deliverance from thoughts of an afterlife. Well, that just about does it for uh, Least Haunted Campfire Club, Volume 2, Meeting 2 of 2023. Hope you all have a good time, and sorry this came out on Saturday. If I edit it all right, maybe Sunday, good. Anyway, we're hopefully coming out two weeks from now next Friday. And a week from, well, six days from now, you'll be able to see uh, or hear our next Least Haunted episode. So uh, I will bid you all a fond farewell and see you where, um, god damn, my thumb's getting hot. See you um, where the only thing that's haunted here is you.
That's it. Bye.